welcome. Thank you. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure. All right, all right. So nailing it so far. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Apple's in the process of making a big, you know, transition is one way to put it. Uh, definitely a push on the consumer side into services to flesh out their services businesses. Uh, obviously, the hardware businesses are well established and understandable to uh, the market. But what does the enterprise side of that look like? Yep. So. Um Tremendous opportunity, right? A lot of companies offering services. For Apple, we have a few things that are targeted um, uh, squarely at business from a services point of view um, that we can talk about. One of them is our um, technology called Apple Business Manager, which is a one-stop shop for IT where you can create and manage Apple IDs, where you can purchase and distribute apps, um, and you can set your... Um, policies with protocols to feed into the MDM solution that you might be using. Um, that service we started about a year and a half ago. Um, it's a for free service available to businesses and actually um, never before stated, Matthew, hot <laughs> off the press. Thanks um, for Telegraph. That was good. <laughs> we have, um, we just uh, passed uh, 80,000 organizations, which includes corporations with subsidiaries and so forth, that are taking advantage of Apple Business Managers. So that's this is an, a, an evolution of the MDM solution, right? Yeah, we used to have something called device enrollment, uh, pro the, DEP the DEP solution, and um, we had a volume purchase program, and we had some disparate pieces, some of it on the um, policy side, some of it on the app side, and it was a little bit of a hassle, and we really do want to remove friction, and mm -hmm. so uh, we were getting a lot of feedback from IT uh, departments and maybe some of you here today saying you've got to make this simpler. So we kind of consolidated the tasks an IT organization might want to do managing a fleet of Apple devices into this Apple Business Manager. So that's that's one right. um, offering that we have from a services point of view. Yeah, and, and that's first party software like Business Manager, uh, Business Chat is another one that you offer, right? And are, is this like a pillar of the Apple Enterprise strategy, offering these first party tools to the enterprise? Yeah, where we think we can do it in a meaningful way or a differentiated way, where it helps remove friction in the process, we look to provide that. So Business Chat, um, for anyone who's not aware, is a, a sort of a riff off messages where mm -hmm. customers can communicate def directly to a business, uh, for example, Lowe's, just by texting or SMSing through messages um, their question or their, their uh, you know, their right, issue. Right. And so that's been um, a great addition to the portfolio as well. And then even, uh, you know, AppleCare is a big part of our service offering, and we have a dedicated AppleCare for enterprise as another service offering. So you don't have to bring like 300 devices to the Apple Store? Exactly, it's a little awkward. We found um, that didn't always work well. So we have a offering that um, has been in place for a little while. We've been evolving it as we have um, growing you know, deployments. We have hundreds of businesses now with tens of thousands of devices and the support needs there you know, are of a certain kind. You need an account manager, right? IT doesn't want to have a nameless, faceless conversation just over business chat. You need 24-7 right. tech support. You need on-site hardware, hardware repair, an easy ability to switch out devices, and so forth. So we do have a dedicated AppleCare for Enterprise service offering um, that's, that's been pretty well received and part of our overall AppleCare offering. Um, and we even have something um, cryptically named Apple Financial Services, which are financial services from Apple. Um, Never would have guessed. <laughs> it, yeah. Right? I know sometimes our naming. Um, but the, the um, interesting thing there is they're very flexible, transparent models that look at a company to understand the kind of upgrade cycles, for example, mm -hmm. that they prefer. And we're able to you know, customize the financial services model to that. Um, the other um, is there a partner in that financial service offering? There is. Offering? There's oh. a back end, you know, uh, uh, offer, you know, partner who who helps execute the Apple financial services. And um, but the discussion is, you know, with Apple to establish that mm -hmm. for an account. Um, and it also takes advantage of something that um, I hope is not a well kept secret. But we have great hardware residual value mm -hmm. for our devices. And with our Apple Financial Services offerings, we're also able to take advantage of that to make the uh, cash flow and the affordability of the devices over, say, a three to four year term for a Mac or a two to three year term for a phone or an iPad, mm -hmm. allows the business to take advantage of those residual values 
throughout the process, the term of the agreement. Is that a two-way program? Is it like trade-in or, or upgrade? You uh, can do either. You can own at the end or you can, um, you know, okay. replace at the end. So right. you can, you can, you know, as I said, it's, it's really pretty flexible. Right. Um, and the idea is to just make it easy and underscore um, ways to make our products uh, the affordability more right. apparent for businesses. Those are some examples of our services. Matthew and Got it. You know, watch this space. Who knows? <laughs> um, okay, so to, like, to riff on the business chat thing a, a little tiny bit. So that's obviously one offering, and it's based on the backbone of the work you've done with messages. Yep. Um, I think there are a lot of corporations, a lot of big companies use messages, FaceTime, and other tools that Apple provides as ad hoc, you know, corporate comms. And I yep. know Apple uses messages internally as corporate comms. We do. So is there plans to package that more holistically for a company? Because it seems like, you know, you have Slack and these other, other offerings out there. But I know, like, personally, we often have reservations about how much data we share with Slack, uh, how safe that data is, and that sort of, th sort of thing. So with Apple's reputation, it seems like you can make a strong offering there. Yeah. Um, we have nothing to talk about today, but it, it is a case that people are using those, doing things like uh, expanding FaceTime for 32 people at once is something that a family may use if you have a lot of kids. Um, I <laughs> yeah. only have three, but, but it's you pretty know. extreme. Yeah. <laughs> but um, also could be great for teams collaborating in businesses. So we're moving some of those offerings uh, towards you know indoor mapping uh, that right. we offer in maps where you could have not just inside of an airport or a mall, but inside of a campus like Apple Park, which can be kind of confusing yeah, you get, like, to navigate. Stuff, yeah. um, so there's a lot of ways you could imagine applying those services to business today. Um, you know, nothing specific about packaging packaging them up, right. but um, but I hear you, and I think uh, there is opportunity for these products to be used more into business. Yeah, I mean, I hate every messenger we use, so besides messages, so just as a personal. Well, thank you. Yeah. Is he just saying that because I'm here? But yes, <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so historically, the story of Apple in the enterprise has been about, like, sort of hinged on the story of BYOD, mm -hmm. right? People get fall in love with Apple devices outside. They're like, I really want to use these for work, and they bring them in, and the IT sort of has to wrap their heads around how to incorporate those. A lot of that work has been done and, and been done over the years, but how how has enterprises' approach to selling into that channel changed as you started to start to come in the front door through CSOs and yeah. that kind of thing? We see it kind of as an evolution, and it did start really with iPhone uh, back in uh, 2007 and, and with the BYOD model and, of course, um, triggering a lot of the consumerization of IT and, you know, your team's written about that and I'm sure uh, m most of the audience is quite familiar with that as well. Um, and that was great for us. That worked, you know, really well for us, taking the passion of the consumers uh, for technology to bring it into the business. Um, I would say there was kind of three phases. So the second thing was the availability of the iPad in 2010. And the iPad... Um, um, was an interesting trigger. People were already having, um, you know, pretty decent numbers of iPhones in their um, workplaces. We did a lot of the work for integration and security, you know, the basics to have those work. Um, as the iPad came out, it became more apparent, gee, we have a lot of these devices. iPad seemed like a great business tool, and there's a super cool SDK. So what started to happen then was a little bit more attention to corporate liable and to building custom apps for iPad but also for iPhone. Mm -hmm. And so that was a little different and that kind of, because it would be, for example, for, uh, you know, maybe it was a uh, field service organization that was gonna be using the devices, corporate libel made sense, you know, that the hardware would be purchased and the plans would be paid for by the company. So that right. changed the BYOD um, to some degree. What we see, Today, as we continue, um, obviously building those custom apps happen on the Mac, which is part of the third phase. Um, but what we see is BYOD continues to coexist with institutionally owned. And a lot of our work has been trying to let people do what they want with their device, paying attention to who owns the device. So um, we can talk more about that in a second, but to finish answering you know, the, mm. the core of your question, I think the third phase was really, um, interesting and it's a yet a different model which is a little different than BYOD and purely institutional owned and it has to do with the resurgence of Mac that's happened with the success of our iOS devices or the uh, adoption of our iOS that and halo I effect, iPad OS. Right? that halo effect and so it's not just creative departments it's not just the developers who are creating apps for these companies but it's productivity you know using the Mac as a productivity tool and that third phase um, is really around Mac as a choice what we're seeing is businesses are giving the employees mm. the option 
for um, the, what they want to use. And um, right. uh, I, maybe many of you are familiar with IBM, who um, in our wildest dreams, we wouldn't have thought they would have over almost 300,000 Apple devices at IBM, and well over 100,000 of them are Macs. And that was simply based on giving employees choice mm -hmm. um, Jamf is a, a great partner, and you know they had done some great studies that say three and four employees given a choice mm -hmm. will choose a Mac. And we see that playing out over and over in businesses. Um, you know, SAP, who I think is obviously here. We just heard someone from, I, from SAP um, at HCA, a large healthcare organization, and many, many other organizations. So that idea of device as a choice, letting the um, you know institutionally owned, perhaps, or subsidized, but right. letting the user pick from uh, yeah, yeah, so lubricating the channel once the user makes the choice, lubricating the channel for the for the company. Right. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, personally owned devices. So I know you have a new tool for that. So ah. can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, super exciting. So um, we at Apple um, have a, a blessing and a burden, which is people brought these devices into enterprise in the first place because they love them. And so as we look at building capabilities to make sure IT and the corporation can manage those devices appropriately, we want to do it without friction for the IT folks, but without compromising the end user experience. And that sounds really easy, um, but those of you who are a little closer to it may know it's, it's difficult. It's right. difficult sometimes to solve uh, for the very legitimate issues or concerns an IT department might have without creating a crippling experience where someone can't really use an iPhone or an iPad yeah. or a Mac. Yeah, Verizon the keeps installing this MDM profile on my device that eliminates iCloud. Yeah. I use a ton of apps that and you're like, sync with iCloud. Now. Like, yeah. come on now. They so don't know I can delete it. <laughs> Oh, they don't hear from Verizon, please step <laughs> out. Um, so, so what we've done, and it's kind of been building on, we, we put um, lots of enterprise features in every release since 2008, quite honestly. It was the year after the first iPhone shipped that we really began incorporating um, enterprise features into the device around security, around management, around identity, around productivity. But um, what we've done this year that built on, um, for those of you familiar with it, APFS, a file system we announced a couple of years ago, um, which enables us to create volumes and, and some other great core technologies, is something called user enrollment. And user enrollment is super cool because it's meant for BYOD, which as I mentioned earlier, hasn't gone away. It's still a viable way that people are bringing technology into business. But when you have your own device and you bring it into a company, there's two things that may happen. Sometimes IT says, I want to manage your device, and the right. user says, yeah, but this is my personal device. I'm not going, you know, giving you complete control over my passcode and all these other things. Um, some it's of the especially time, a concern, by the way, in media, because we have sources, we talk with them, we don't want to give, you know, corporate access to all of that. There's kind of stuff that's, per, you know, right. that's personal, and, and we, we care about that a lot. Now, if you're the end user, you also, um, you know, are probably thinking, you know, I want to keep my data private. But in right. some cases, the IT folks are like, I don't even want your private information. I just need to make sure that the corporate information and data that's on your device is adequately protected, that when you leave the company, I can eliminate and wipe you know, your access to certain things, the data that's on your phone or your iPad, et cetera. So with user enrollment, we actually allow two devices on your Two, two IDs. I'm like, two devices? Yeah. Where do I allow two Two IDs device? on a single you device. You can have lots right? of devices. Yeah. Two IDs on a single device. So yeah. you have your personal Apple ID, and then you have a managed Apple ID that I mentioned to Apple Business Manager earlier. You can easily create managed Apple IDs um, for the organization or for the individual who's bringing their own phone. And with that, we have the ability, and this is simplifying it, but it's a really powerful concept. We have the ability to, without crippling your access to apps and services for your personal use, give you protected, appropriately sandboxed access to the apps and services your company wants you to be and using. And the user experience is seamless. The user experience is simple. I don't log out of one ID and log into another. We know, based on the ID, uh, based on what you're doing, where you're doing it, we know that you know perhaps this particular app is associated up here, but your Photos app is right. very personal, and I don't want my kids sitting on my yeah. know, corporate cloud. And so the benefit to the user is clear, right? They don't they can bring their own personal device that they're already using. They don't have to carry two. One's usually in a corporate case, and Nobody all of this stuff. Nobody wants to carry two, and we've known that for yeah. a long time. But this really, I think, is a big step forward, um, and we're hearing great response. Any of you who have been, um, you know, who plan to implement it with iOS 13 and iPadOS who have feedback, 
let us know. But we're hearing really great responses um, on the betas for how this is helping to address that issue. Uh, we hold dear removing any end user friction, but respecting what IT needs to do. And we feel like this is a really great answer to that. So it's called user enrollment with iOS 13, and it's um, it, it works pretty well, you know, pretty great. Cool. Um, one one thing I wanted to ask about is so over the over the last several years, um, mm -hmm. Apple's put more and more focus on on-demand, on-device processing. Um, they have built custom silicon uh, put into iPhones and iPads, yeah. uh, and then custom software, obviously, to aid in uh, building and running ML models locally on device, that sort of thing. So how is Apple thinking about like selling into the enterprise this opportunity to offload, obviously, processing to local devices to A, reduce just processing load uh, at a central unit, and then also uh, security and privacy-wise. Sounds a lot like an edge computing question. <laughs> yeah, it is an edge computing so, question. Um, so it's a great question. And obviously, um, there are some things kind of converging here that, um, once again, are potentially a, a great um, scenario for us, um, or for people using our devices. Because as you said, um, there's tremendous progress. You see demos if anybody uh, watches our events at the Worldwide Developer Conference or you know other product events. The, the, the processing power of these devices is dramatically improving year on year. We're not talking about mobile chips in an iPhone or on an iPad. We're talking about hardcore silicon, um, and we're talking also about the opportunity to build things into the chips. So, for example, so I'll, I'll kind of wrap back around to specifically what you're, you're asking about, but for example, um, in our A-series chip, we have a dedicated part of the chip purpose-built around machine learning. So it's called the Neural Engine, and it's an instruction set optimized for machine learning to be able to process data on your device, to et cetera. So that's an example of bringing the decision making to the device. Now, our motivation in doing that, in large part, was privacy, right? So if you want to um, have news, understand what you like to read, you want suggestions from the operating system, you want to know how early you need to leave for your next appointment on your calendar, you don't necessarily want to be sharing all of that, you know into a cloud. So there's a lot of things that have driven um, on-device processing that are around privacy for us. At the same time, we're now in a world where that kind of power on device and the opportunity to use these devices for hardcore computing without having to go up to a data center or a dedicated server is quite compelling. So we, we, we definitely see um, organizations looking at taking advantage of the on-device processing power, the, the very real compute power of these devices as part of a solution to, um, you know, less, uh, you know, maybe there's not bandwidth, maybe you don't want to be um, s sending stuff up to these data centers. So right. um, our devices as a piece of, you know, edge computing as a way uh, to manage how that data moves around, uh, we think is very powerful. And we've, we are having some fun as that area starts to, con you know, it continues to grow, looking at how our products can play there and what more we can and should be doing, as you said, with our custom silicon, uh, with our software and beyond, uh, to make those viable for the things people want to do right. uh, from an edge computing point of view on device, in addition to the things that we want to help users keep private on their device. Sure, sure. Um, just a, like a, to wrap it up, a kind of a personal question: Like, where, where does iWork fit into the enterprise strategy? Like, how does that? How do you see that as a tool that you can pitch to the enterprise as a viable productivity suite? Yeah. Um, first of all, um, I love iWork. So you're asking a, a biased audience. And at <laughs> Apple, um, we do use um, we do use the iWork suite even for our big events. In fact. One of the reasons we began, um, you know, developing uh, the iWork apps and why you know, Keynote was the first was because Steve wanted something great to be able to build Apple Keynotes. And to this day, um, you know, Keynote is what we use for our Apple presentations. Um, so those those apps are gr they're free on your devices. So right. that's great. They're compatible with, for example. Office, right? It's a big 800 pound gorilla. We understand people have a lot of documents that may be on that um, file format and so forth. And so we, we have a good interchange with Microsoft Office. We think the feature set, if you want to create brilliant um, looking presentations, maybe, you know, my ideas are so so, but my slides are going to be killer. Um, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> so um, if you want to, you know, create beautiful documents that stand out in pages in Keynote and even in a spreadsheet app 
where it's a blank canvas where you can visualize data in incredibly creative ways. It's not just a spreadsheet. It's great. Is it for everyone? It may not be for everyone, but we do see small and medium-sized businesses adopting iWork. And we see some large businesses who say they're built, you know, it's built in. Let's take a look. Um, Keynote in particular, um, pages and numbers as well, get uptake in some companies. But it's not pervasive yet. We've done some things um, to make it, I think, more useful and more attractive, which we've also added to a number of our other apps, which is collaboration features, right? right. That's something that surely um, Google's done a great job at, is, you know, collaboration first, and we sure. believe that is really important. So we've added yeah, the ability to- multi-user doc editing is like a super off-sited advantage of Google. Right, and right. then when you have something like Keynote, where you have these big, complex, slides and they're big, mm -hmm. how do you collaborate seamlessly? So we've had some hard problems to solve, but uh, we have a pretty, we're in a pretty great place with that. Um, so collaboration in iWork, it's also in things like notes and reminders, because I think overall for productivity in the enterprise, you want that. So I think iWork has a place. Is it for everyone? Is it ubiquitous? No, but the people who use it absolutely mm -hmm. love it. So yeah. if you haven't tried it, try it. Excellent. Well, thanks. Well, we're over time, and uh, I stayed because they can't kick me off. So thank you very much. <laughs> it's kind of fun I to have Matthew as my partner. <laughs> <Yeah. so. laughs> thank, thank you very you much. Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks. All right. Thanks. <laughs>